Hello, my name is Harold Hafta and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we're going to be building a Roman aqueduct. I also want to point out that I broke this episode into two parts. I did this because after I finished it, the episode ended up being pretty long. And so I thought it would be best to break it up into a part one and then a part two. So there'll be a cut in the middle. Hopefully that's not too disturbing. I also want to point out that I'm building this aqueduct on the Archeo SMP, and parts of it are in the shadow of my server mate, Canadian Dragon's Ice Farm. Dragon's a great Minecrafter and streams over on Twitch, as well as uploads his VODs onto YouTube. I'm going to link his channel as well as the channels of the other content creators who post content on the Archeo SMP in the description, so that if you want to check out their videos, you can do so, and I highly recommend you do that, because they're all great people and great content creators. Now, I bet when I say Roman aqueduct, you might think about this kind of structure or maybe something maybe like this. Basically, a majestic and monumental structure that spans rivers and valleys, soars over the landscape. And yes, you would be right. That's what a Roman aqueduct looks like, but only in part. You see, there are lots of different aspects of Roman aqueducts, and the vast majority of their length, about 80%, were not the structures you see above ground. That was only part of what made up the aqueduct. And in this episode, while we will build the visually inspiring section, i.e. the bridge, I mean, how else am I gonna get a wicked sweet thumbnail? We'll also be talking about the other parts that made up a Roman aqueduct, including how they were constructed, what they were built out of, as well as a little bit about their economics and everything else I suspect you may be interested in. So let's jump into it. As I'm sure you know, Romans were genius builders and famous for their engineering prowess. While they didn't have names for the forces of nature that we use today, they did have a strong practical understanding of them. So, for example, while they didn't have a name for the forces behind tension, friction, gravity, or pressure, they understood that water found its own level and traveled downhill. And this is at its base level how the Roman aqueducts were designed. In almost all cases, with some rare exceptions, Roman aqueducts worked by water running downhill. In nature, water will always find its own level, barring any obstruction or barrier, and so mountain lakes, snow melt, or springs would pool and then travel down the mountains and hills and find their way to the sea or the ocean. We, of course, call these things rivers, and I find that this is an easy way to think about what an aqueduct is. Basically, it's a man-made river. You see, Romans couldn't often depend on the natural rivers in their environment having safe water to drink. That's where shipping traveled and where sewage and other pollutants were dumped. And so a fresh, steady, alternative source of water was needed for Rome and other Roman cities. And this fresh source of water was distributed to villas for the rich, fountains for the commoners, or plebs as the Romans called them, to collect drinking and cooking water from, or for businesses to use in their industries. It was also used for watering gardens, or for use in the famous Roman baths, where Romans socialized and cleaned themselves. It was also likely used to some extent for irrigation in farm fields, though ancient writers are pretty scant on mentioning that specific use case. Rome itself had 11 different major aqueducts which were built over a 500 year span between 312 BC and AD 226, as well as around 8 to 12 minor aqueducts. The shortest aqueduct around 16 kilometers or around 10 miles long, and the longest was 91 kilometers or around 56 miles long. To put that quantity of water into perspective, that was estimated to being around 1.1 million cubic meters of water being brought into Rome each day for a Roman population of around 1 million, give or take. That is roughly equivalent to modern day New York City, which not counting commuters who travel into the city for work, uses around 5.5 million cubic meters of water per day for a population of around 6 million. With that background out of the way, let's talk about what made up the parts of the aqueduct themselves. As I mentioned before, it all starts high up in the mountains where snow melts, rainfall or natural springs would collect and pool into naturally occurring lakes or dependable sources of groundwater. The writings of Vitruvius, a Roman architect, engineer, and author who lived from around 80 to 15 BC, 
showed that the Romans were understandably very selective when it came to identifying the source of where their water came from. He describes how you should avoid areas with clay and says areas with loose gravel, the water supply will be less and the flavor not good. But in areas with coarse gravel, red rock or sand, that there will be a good supply of water with good flavor. He also advises looking at the condition of the locals who normally drink that water as well as a prevalence of water loving plants, rushes, willows and good green grass, even in the dry season. Basically, the Romans are looking at context clues by paying attention to details of the surrounding flora and fauna and the geology of the area to identify whether the source was healthy and was being fed by a steady flow of water or underground springs. Because the aqueduct's water supply was controlled through gravity, great care was given to ensure that the route the aqueduct would run was thoroughly surveyed. I talked a bit about the Romans' level of surveying prowess in my episode on Romans' roads and road stations, but suffice to say that they were experts in charting the proper path as well as creating a proper grade which allowed the water to consistently flow through the aqueduct without running too fast nor too slow. Vitruvius says that the ideal angle for this water's descent would be around half a degree, but archaeological evidence showed that this was sometimes closer to a third of a degree. To put that into a bit of a different perspective, that's a drop of around 10 to 20 centimeters for every one kilometer distance. That's an astounding feat of accuracy. If the slope was too slight, the river running through the aqueduct would become stagnant and pool, but if it was too much of a slope, the water would run too fast and cause much more wear and tear on the aqueduct, increasing the cost and the need for maintenance. The Romans had a number of specialized surveying tools, some of which would allow them to sight down a view and then leverage hanging plumb bobs, or essentially hanging lead weights, that allowed them to work out what the angle of the terrain was, or the slope, based on the viewing angle of a pole that they would hold and then look down. There was also an interesting surveying tool that was like a table that would allow the surveyor to set the table in the aqueduct's channel and then use various adjustments on the table and leveraging a small groove in the table where you could pour water that where you could exactly tell the degree of the slope and the levelness of the table based on the water. All pretty ingenious stuff, I think. The masonry used in the construction of the aqueducts leveraged a number of different materials. As has been mentioned in past episodes of this channel, the Romans made frequent use of tufa, in other words, tuff, which is compressed volcanic ash that has the unusual property that it's softer stone when it's just mined, but hardens when exposed to air. Blocks of this could be obtained by using saws with iron or copper blades and using sand to help increase the friction of the saw when you're running it back and forth and making your cut. They also used travertine and also limestone in the aqueduct's construction, as well as two different forms of brick blocks, sun-dried bricks, or basically mud bricks, and kiln-baked bricks, boy that's hard to say, or basically regular looking bricks. Since many of these materials are available as blocks in Minecraft and don't look too bad together, I'm going to try and use the combination of these in my recreation. Bricks and mud bricks were often coated with a layer of stucco to help them keep more water resistant and thus create a longer lasting structure. So I'm going to layer in some terracotta blocks in Minecraft to approximate what that might look like as well. Bricks were often stamped with who created them, so you can get the name of the consul who, or the leader of Rome, who commissioned the material or aqueduct to be created. Other times the bricks were stamped with the owner of the brick field that made the bricks, and often if a Roman legion was the one who created the aqueduct or made the bricks, the legion was also identified via stamp. This all allowed archaeologists to be able to date when different aqueducts were created and where that material came from. There were also a number of different kinds of pipes used in aqueducts. The most common was for there to simply be a masonry channel that the water would run through. While the size of these channels would vary, often they were around 2.5 meters high by about a meter or two wide. The water was only expected to run about half to at most three-fourths of the height of the channel, but it was that wide and tall to allow maintenance to occur. In other words, some poor Roman worker had to be able to get into the channel to keep the water running smoothly or troubleshoot issues when they would occur. 
the part of the masonry that was expected to have water passing over it had a couple of layers of concrete. That concrete was smoothed and polished so that it would allow there to be less friction and disturbance as the water passed over it. This not only provided a more predictable speed for the water to flow, but it also allowed the water to cause less damage to the channel and the aqueduct and slowed the buildup of calcium and lime deposits so maintenance was reduced, improving also the quality of the water. The Romans also used clay pipes in aqueducts as well. These ceramic pipes, or essentially fired clay pipes, could be 20 centimeters or more wide in an internal dimension and then each section of the clay pipes would fit end to end into one another with each segment of the ceramic pipe being as long as 70 to 75 centimeters in length. The ceramic pipe would be laid on a gravel bed or slate tiles or sand to help provide a consistent base and minimize movement or damage from seismic or freeze thaw cycles. Another type of pipe that was used was lead. While lead piping was much more expensive, it was quite a bit more flexible and could thus be used in more applications where there was a need to withstand a great deal more water pressure and so could be used in applications such as siphons or fountains. A siphon used the principle that water finds its own level. And so one way that a Roman might span a valley with an aqueduct system that they didn't want a bridge across was to create an inverted siphon. With that system, a pipe was laid at a steep angle that would follow the slope of the incline and then cross the valley lower to the valley's floor. The pipe would then steeply ascend the far side. As long as the far end of the pipe was lower than the near end, and as long as the pipe could withstand the additional pressure the siphon required, that was a far easier and sometimes cheaper way to span a gap than building a bridge. Siphons were also used to divert water if needed to enable repairs or maintenance to occur on portions of the aqueduct. So basically, they could shut down a portion of the aqueduct by putting a siphon in place to then allow an area of the aqueduct to be dry so that they could then work on that or still allow the water flowing through the aqueduct as a whole. I also want to touch on the lead for a minute here. It's a bit of a myth that the Romans were wholly unaware of the toxic and ill effects of lead. While the exact mechanism or reason behind the danger wasn't known to them, the Roman writer Vitruvius does mention the ill effects of it on the workers who smelt and casted with that material. I would also point out, as a bit of an aside, that much of the world, and certainly a lot of America, until very recently used lead pipes in our modern plumbing, so it would be a bit hypocritical to look down the Romans for the use of the material, although, for the record, it's a very dangerous element and best avoided. Beyond lead pipes, the Romans also occasionally used bronze pipes, though excavations have shown that when they were used, they were only used for specialized use cases like distributors and fountains, sculptures, or specific joints. However, you can see in my Minecraft build, I use copper lightning rods in my structure as you can't lay pipes horizontally end to end, and there aren't things like lead pipes in the game, so I'm using copper lightning rods to mimic metal or ceramic piping. Two other types of pipes the Romans would use, which you might not know about, are pipes that were used by leveraging stone blocks and by using wooden piping. With stone pipes, they would create that by drilling through a stone block to create a hole through the stone block and then the stones would be stacked one on top of the other to create a pathway for the water to run through all of the stone blocks. Wooden pipes were also used frequently in northern Europe and in places like Germany and Britain. They were cheap, easy to work with, and had the advantage that they could be shaped into curves but deteriorated quickly and were not a material that lasted long and required a lot of maintenance or replacements much more often. We're about halfway through the video, so I'm going to break it here. Please join us next time on part two where we finish the aqueduct and talk through the remainder of the parts of the aqueduct, and then you can see the final build all put together. Well, that wraps up this video. As normal, I put some resources I uncovered while doing my research for this video in the description, so you can check those out if you want to learn more. If you want to check out more videos I've made about the Romans and their works of architecture, please check out these links. Thanks for watching part one, and look forward to seeing you in part two. Well, that's it. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.